This is Haringey, North London. Wood Green, Tottenham, Broadwater Farm. Growing up here means growing up with a past which is not your own. And this is our school, Greg City Academy. As a head teacher, I have always believed in the power of education to make a difference to the life and future of a child. And I have always believed that the best education happens inside and outside the classroom. Here at the school, I have teachers who share that belief and have a vision about how that happens. One, John Holt, has had the vision to imagine a unique journey for children, which started on eBay in a farmer's field and we hope will finish with those same young people entering and completing the world's largest offshore fleet race, the Fast Net. This short film tells the story so far. I've been a teacher in Harrogate now for 16 years and I've seen our door pursuits do some incredible things. It provides all students with access to experiences which otherwise they may not be able to do. In extreme cases, it's drawn some students to some of the most prestigious universities in the UK, and on the other hand, kept some students free of crime and antisocial behaviour. The common theme which underpins both of these successes is outdoor education. For 16 years, we have canoed, kayaked, cycled, climbed, dinghy sailed our way around the UK. Not one-off trips, but a regular programme to make outdoor pursuits part of the students' everyday lives. We've recently decided to invest in sailing and also yachting. We did this by purchasing five dinghies, two catamarans, and also one 22-foot McGregor cruising boat. Each of the boats we've bought so far have needed restoration, and they've been restored and are now in full use by our school. What's that white boat over there? Part of the reason GCA Sailing does this is to give our students the skills and qualifications that they can use for the rest of their lives. At the minute, we have 250 students from the Greg City Academy completing their RIA Level 1 to 3 dinghy qualifications down in Paul. Sailing is the epitome of outdoor education. It provides all of the skills which the other activities require rolled into one. It requires physical strength, intellectual capability, it requires concentration over long periods of time, it requires teamwork. And also it shows that if you work hard at something, at the end, there are great rewards. Well, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that um, that's a very powerful intro movie to the 12th edition of the Royal Ocean Racing Club Time Over Distance series. And over those last 11, we've had Olympic medalists, we've had America's Cup winners, we've had Volvo Ocean Race winners. Well, this week's guest is not a professional sailor and he's not won any world championships but John Holt and the Scaramouche Sailing Trust have won the heart and the support of the sailing community. John joins us from the classroom of the Greg City Academy in North London. John, a warm welcome to the show. Thank you very much Lorraine. Hello to everyone at, at Rourke. We hope to share some of our story with you this evening and then uh, see if we can uh, sort of maybe give some advice about youth sailing, possibly. And uh, uh, John, you let slip yesterday. You're going sailing tomorrow, aren't you? We, we are. We're setting off at six in the morning. Two of the boys are do have decided to do the two-handed nab tower race, and they're they're desperate to go down and train on their boat first. So yeah, it's a, a six thirty in the morning start tomorrow, all the way down there. They want to go on Sunday as well, but that means going there and back. So we'll we'll see. Okay. And, uh, and and real hot off the press, race run, race the white, the the Rourke's, uh, debut race since the COVID uh, crisis, August the first, and um, the um, the two spot, the two uh, charities or I should say benefactors from that are going to be the NHS and the Scaramouche Sailing Trust. That's right. Yes, that's amazing. I mean, it's a great honour for us to have that sort of recognition. And I think it's, uh, I've, I'll allude to that in the, the, the talk, it's just typical of the sort of support we've had from the from the whole sailing community throughout the project. Okay. And um, just, to, just to explain to uh, the viewers, we've got four of the sailors from the Scaramouche project that are going to be uh, saying their piece uh, during this uh, hour-long show. Um, and uh, we will uh, ask John to uh, put a bit of uh, flesh on the bones there about those particular sailors and about 
what they're talking about. And uh, first off, John, um, in that end, in that intro video, um, you highlighted teamwork. Why is that so important to you? Um, this whole project has been all about teamwork. This this started with a group of students who had uh, tremendous motivation to undertake new challenges and new projects. Uh, we at the school, there was myself and another teacher, Paul Letford, who decided that we'd try and uh, make that uh, dream happen for them. Uh, they 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 started off with, um, but we started off just doing general outdoor education trips in the school for. In, uh, I think in 1998, I came to London as a geography teacher, as a very sort of enthusiastic uh, sort of te geography teacher who thought we'll start doing outdoor education, we'll, tr we'll, we'll tr start trying to get ed education out of the classroom. And we were doing trips every single weekend, doing canoeing, kayaking, mountain biking all over the UK. I had a mm -hmm. little bit of a background in sailing. Uh, I'd, I'd built a 19 foot boat with my dad. I'd built a, a pram dinghy when I was 12, which I put a a mirror dinghy uh, rig on, thinking that would make it go really fast, and it and it, it did at times, and, and didn't others. Um, and then, but the problem with starting sailing in schools was that it, it, we weren't able to really get you know bang for our buck, which was that we couldn't take enough students in one go to kind of make it viable. And then we we then went on. We found a uh, we we found a centre which could take 24 students at a time. And then we actually did a trip. We did an outdoor education trip in Kinsale where the students were sailing on, on squibs. There's one above my, my right ear as well there, on the, on yeah. the wall there. And then the, the kids absolutely loved it. And then we started to do the trips to Poole. We were taking 24 at a time to the, uh, to, down to Poole. We did that for maybe, I think, 10, 15 weekends. So we were taking literally hundreds of students sailing. Uh, they all loved it, but a few of them really stuck out. They were really committed. You know, there's Montel, Camillo, Karim, Shabazz. Uh, Jordan, Nicholas, or quite a few of them, and they were really keen and wanted to take it further. Yeah, and and my word, did you take it further? And uh, head teacher Paul Sutton in that uh, in that preview video, um, he mentions the Rolex Fastnet race as the goal. Why did you set that? I mean, that you know, it's the Everest for a lot of people to do the Rolex Fastnet race. Um, so we were very clear that if we were going to do sailing, uh, the idea is we're there to try and enhance the students' life chances. And to do that, we wanted to make it measurable. I think it's easy to say that some activity is going to improve a child's life chances, but there's a very difference, big difference between that actually being measurable and actually happening. So we didn't want to set sort of false challenges. We wanted to set a real and genuine challenge. And then we knew that would, would be a massive challenge. So for us, it was a. We knew that we knew that Rourke was a you know, really prestigious organisation. We knew that the Fastnet was one of the biggest races that they that they organised. So for us, it was sort of fairly logical. The, the, the other thing was to to do those races. Of course, we had to get a boat, and, and we didn't have a boat. We had uh, we had some boats we brought off eBay. We were dinghy sailing, and to get into racing, the question was: is how could we combine big numbers of reasonably large numbers of students? and then also have that level of challenge. So we decided to do the fast net. We needed to get a boat. We didn't have one. So we again turned to eBay once again and, uh, and we found Scaramouche. Uh, I, I won't go into details. We did originally want to buy Rothmans, which was my dream boat as a teenager growing up. Uh, that for me was like the Formula One car of, of all boats. But um, anyway, we ended up, Scaramouche was on sale for 70,000 pounds. We went to have a look. We were told under no circumstances should we buy it. Um, so uh, we went down there with a group of the students and then one thing led to another and we realized that people didn't want boats of that age. So you're hardly gonna go cruising with your, with your partner on, on a boat like that. And, uh, and, and racing it, it's a very complicated boat to, boat to race now. So we made them an offer of 16 and a half thousand pounds and they, they took it, they said yes. So we went back, wow. uh, we, I think Paul paid the deposit on his credit card. I think mine had declined. So we, 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 we then paid the deposit and then we went back to the school. And of course, we've been told not to buy it. And we had bought it. So we sent the students in to go and tell our head teacher, Paul Sutton, um, who described me as, at the time, described me as being absolutely bonkers and what on earth I think I was doing. But fortunately, he's described me as far worse things before. So that was, that was no problem. Uh, but, then, but then suddenly we had a boat, you know, and then the interest in it just grew because... 
I think even when we bought Scaramouche, we didn't truly understand how famous the boat was in, in sailing sort of history. Mm. And I think for us, that ended up being a big, a major positive because, you know, we then got the boat ready. We got the boat coded. That costs a lot of money. When, when you talked about teamwork, the teamwork with the students was there right from the start because the, the repairs to the boat were very expensive. And the, every time we got the invoices through for it, the boys had to just go out and do another talk to another another organization to try and get the funding in, which which they did. So it is they had real ownership over the whole project because they were sort of funding it through that in a way. Um, and then we entered a race and we just thought we had absolutely no chance in this race. It was called an Asto race, which was just around the cans, just off out of cows. Uh, we, the boat was kept in pool at the time and to do the delivery there, we had a problem where, first of all, we'd blown out the, the, the only big Genoa we had the week before when we had a film crew on there. And then we therefore had a Genoa, which was about at least two foot too, too short in the foot. Um, we had, during the delivery, we had a problem with the engine. It kept on cutting out every half hour. So we arrived in cows. Um, I was covered in a mixture of oil and blood and burnt arms and everything. Um, the, the boys were like all enthusiastic. Uh, they'd done lots of sail changes because when the engine cut out going through the needles, they had to very swiftly sail the boat really well just to get there. And then um, having, having got there, they were saying, oh, you know, we've got a good chance here. We could win this race. And I was saying to them, look, you're, you're clueless. We're not going to win this race. You know, we've only just got here. We haven't, and, uh, uh, and we, you know, we, we were there with our, our matching Sports Direct kit. So we thought we'd look, look the part at the time. With hindsight, maybe not. And then, anyway, one thing led to another and we ended up winning that race. We, we took line on us in that race. And for us, that was a turning point because uh, we then emailed Laurie Smith about what we were doing. And everyone said to me, no, you know, he won't be interested. Yeah. He's a, you know, he's, um, he's a, pro you know, a professional racer. He's now a, now a businessman. He's not going to be interested in a project like this. And of course he was, he was absolutely great. He, he invited us down to the Royal Southampton Yacht Club. We went down there, delivered a speech to him and he was just great. And he said, yeah, I'll be involved. And he set out his criteria that we had to have the right stuff done on the boat, the keel bolts all taken out and checked and put back in again. And we did all of that. And then he essentially mentored us for quite a while where he would take us to all sorts of uh, different sailing organizations. The best example would be North Sales. Mm -hmm. uh, he said to us, look, be there on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock and meet, you're going to meet, meet a bloke called John Walsh. We went in there, delivered our talk, and then John Walsh came out and said, look, well, we can help you. Here's a Genoa, you know, worth whatever, £4,000 or something. So, of course, we're a school, you know, and, and so we're very, thank you very much. And, you know, we were very polite. And then he said, look, I'll give the boys a tour of the factory. So as they were being led out, Laurie kept me behind and he said, look, watch this. We need to get a mate. So we went around and as the boys were being shown the different, uh, so, you know, different machines mm -hmm. and different cells being built, he said to, he would take John to one side and say, look, John, where's the main? And he'd say, well, you know, next time we'll, we'll think about that. He said, look, come on, you know, no one's going to say you brought them a Genoa. They're all going to say you haven't brought them a main. And then one thing led to another. And by the end of the tour, uh, we had, we had from North Sales, a, a main, a Genoa, um, and a promise Amazing. to service any spinnakers. And that relationship with them has, has stayed all the way through. So. From then on, we knew that doing the fastnet was a was a possibility. So. Yeah, uh, you know, amazing. I I heard it put slightly different way. I heard, I heard that uh, that he badgered them <laughs> into oh, yeah. giving you his sale. That's to say, Laurie Smith. Great connection with Laurie, who was an, a, an Admiral's Cup sailor, and uh, and also uh, Scaramouche, which was also a uh, a boat at that time. And I think you said to me when we were having a chat. You think that the fact that it was an old Admiral's Cup boat actually mm. endeared a lot more people to your project. Is that a fair one? I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we came into this. We were we were a very un unusual school to go and do this. We were a very... The, 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 uh, the, the students were, were sort of unusual, perhaps, to the sailing world for all sorts of reasons. And then um, the boat was unusual as well. So I think we got interest from, from lots of different people. I think you know, hardened sailors were interested in the boat. Uh, then you had people who were more interested in the sort of social aspect of it. You had some people who were teachers or ex-teachers or newer teacher who just thought this is a great way of improving kids' life chances. So we had all those different groups of people in, involved uh, or interested in what we were doing. 
Yeah, and and um, well, you know, let's just put it this way: it was a big effort to get just get to that start line for the Rolex Fast Race two thousand seventeen, but you did it. And we're going to play a video now. Thank you so much to the World Sailing Show and particularly Andrew Priest from Sunset and Vine uh, for letting us show this video. Here is the Greg City Academy in the 2017 Rolex Fastnet Race. <laughs> Serious attacks to try and get past it, and it looks like we might get past it soon. Night before we rounded the fast up, it was gusting around uh, 28 knots. So going up winds around about 12 o'clock at night, grueling, very cold. I say that's the bit where you are pushed the most throughout the fast net. Best moment for me throughout the race was rounding the rock and basically helming and surfing the waves back to Plymouth because I knew every wave that we surfed will take us much closer to Plymouth. Now that I've done the fast net, I could now officially say that I'm a lot more resilient because being able to cope on such a long journey, five days, is a big thing to do. Hey John, you're grinning there. First state school to complete the Rolex Fast to compete in the Rolex Fast Net race, and you'd set out on that journey a little while ago, and you made it. That must have filled all the team with a hell of a lot of pride. It did. It was it was a massive achievement for us. I mean, the whole the whole experience was was tough. You know, with the qualifying races, we were learning a lot about uh, how the students would react to it. We were learning about how how the dynamics on the boat would work. We we settled on the sort of watch system, which we've kept all the way through, actually, where we have five students one teacher and one skipper on each watch and then uh it, it it sort of we had we had difficult times you know there was we had on some cases we had bits and pieces of gear failure we finished every single every single qualifying race so we knew we were uh sort of in good shape for it and the fast net race itself uh we, you know we had a, a a moment where we very nearly didn't make the start line we had a problem with the uh, the tie rods on the on the boat and then the company ocean yacht systems who provided us with standing rig and they they sort of stepped in right at the last minute kept their factory open overnight to manufacture new parts so that's one of the problems of scaramouche actually there's that everything is is completely unique on that boat but um but the, the fast net race itself it was, a, it was a great challenge you know we we finished it the everyone stuck to their role on the boat uh, we did quite well. I think we were 134th out of more than 300 yeah. boats, so we were well in the top half. We had some really good positions in the in the qualifying race as well. So, for those boys, yeah, it was you know arguably life changing and a very good thing to have on their CV. Yeah, and I just spotted there, James Rock. The boys will have stories that last a lifetime, and I think we're going to focus in on on one of those one of the uh, the pupils from the Greg City Academy on board, Montel Fagan. Jordan and and we interviewed Montel this week uh, to find out about that Rolex Fastnet race experience, but also to catch up with where it's led to now. And uh, big thank you to Sportography, and this gives it away, and Hugo Boss uh, for the pictures and the videos. We'll we'll play that video with Montel, and then uh, we'll get back to John. My friends weren't too sure about it because um, no one from like London or Tottenham or who we knew of has done sailing before. So the people who did do sailing were a bit uh, confused about what it was about. And in terms of my parents, my mom 
was a bit skeptical about it because um, I showed her a couple of videos and she did her own research into the like the fast net race and then she saw the, like some of the tragic ones and she was a bit skeptical um, skeptical about it. So, but when she saw like the benefits that came out of it and how how much I enjoyed it, she was really supportive and became my number one supporter and the project's number one supporter. And then, yeah, it just kept on. Everybody else kept on um, backing me and this project after that. Yeah. And I know that the Cows Etchels fleet and some of the people there have done an awful lot for the project. And we, we shouldn't really not mention not mention them. So what what do what, what did the Cows Etchels fleet bring to the Scaramouche project? So um I'll say the Cows Etchels fleet is probably one of the main turning points for me in terms of um how I take um how serious I took sailing. So yeah, it's, it's um, pretty important to experience that. And Cows Etchels Fleet, because David Franks, who is the person who runs the Cows Etchels Fleet, gave us the opportunity to com- um, compete in the youth trials. And we've never sold Etchels before. And in, we had a week's experience before the actual trials happened with um, David Bedford in the middle of January, and it was minus like five degrees, I think, at one point. And it was pretty miserable, but we quite were quite resilient and then just pushed through it. And then at the end of it, we won, I think, four out of six races. And that was like a um, pin, like a key point in terms of seeing how um, serious we could get when we were competing about competing against like um, ding, dingy champions, ex um, ex tools um, champions, like sons and daughters. So it's a bit. Um, bit mind-blowing when we did do that yeah and talking about mind-blowing you know bbc coverage yachtsman of the year i mean how did you cope with all that media attention um at first it was a bit overwhelming of course because i was at the time i was probably around 16 17 and then once i started doing um we started doing a lot of it then i kind of got used to it and i cut um gravitated to it a bit more and I came, became more confident in terms of me speaking on camera. So in terms of doing that, it was a bit of a like good like push in the back for me in terms of being more confident in myself in terms of speaking about what I've done and stuff. Right. And then Hugo Boss. Wow. I mean, how did, how did you come to get involved with uh, Alex Thompson and uh, the Amoka 6 to Hugo Boss? So that all started when I did win the Young Yachtsman of the Year because at the same time, um, Alex Thompson won Yachtsman of the Year. And then we met in the, I think, the dinghy show in London. And then she, we, was talk, we got talking together and he asked me on a, he asked me if I wanted to go on a day out on who we were bossing around, around January, February. And of course I said yes, because it's a muscle um, life like opportunity. And then I went, I went to the day and as soon as I got on the boat, we set off. Um, and then Alex gave me the helm straight away. And I was a bit, like, confused because I've never sailed a boat of that caliber before. Uh, but of course, I never said no. So I went on the helm and the weather was perfect for the boat. And we got up to, like, 32 knots, nearly 35. And from then, Alex saw how keen I was and how um, good I was at, at the helm. So it gave me opportunity to have like a week's experience on Hugo Boss and work with the team for a week in around June of that year. And then I did the week's trial and I really enjoyed it. And it was a couple of weeks before I was meant to go to university in Portsmouth. And then I always wanted to take a gap year after doing my A-levels, but I never knew what I wanted to do. So I asked um, Alex and the team if I could stay on for a little bit longer. And they said, yeah, and then it just took off from there. And then... Um, I learned a lot from them and did a lot of sailing with them as well. So, Montel, how has sailing changed your life? Um, it's changed my life in many different ways. In terms of me, in terms of my personality, it's made me, I think, more confident and more likely to like push myself to do things that I wouldn't do in, in the past. 
So I think in terms of that and open up opportunities, of course, it's changed my life in so many different ways. Uh, some, some I can't even imagine. Like, in terms of, well, as I said, it's made me get to uni unconditionally and open up the doors in terms of sailing and boats that I put onto. Um, and probably just say thank you to everybody who supported the project from the beginning and supported the project in general. Um, because without their help and without their um, communication and sharing everything, we wouldn't be at the point where we are all at now because everybody has their own thing going on. So I just have to say a big thank you to everybody who has supported. Wow. I mean, what what an amazing number of doors are open for Montel. I, I remember him about 2015 handing out pamphlets in Cow's High Street. You know, yeah. and and uh, it, that that's an incredible journey. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Montel. He's he's a, he's been a bit of a role model for for this sailing project, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, Montel was the first real trailblazer for this for this project because there was there was no one before him. He he had no one really to look up to at all, and he was the first one who sort of took hold of the the, the sort of the, the sport in, in our school and uh, was maybe pulled in lots of different directions by us. He wanted to really focus on his dinghy sailing and we were had the fast net to do, so we wanted him on that boat and things. But he's he's an incredibly uh, disciplined young man. He's He's got a lot of that. He's a, he's a black belt in, in in different forms of martial arts and things like that. So he's, he's a very, he's got a lot of, he's got a real focus on the, on the training and commitment that's required to it. And uh, going with that, I mean, in the school, he's got extremely high personal standards. He, he did have when he was here uh, while he was in the school. So he's been absolutely great. And the opportunities have opened up for him have been, have been, you know, a lot. And I think mm. uh, that opportunity he got with Hugo Boss, I think summed up a lot of things quite well, where um, before he got the big opportunity with them, they were phoning the school and phoning me and saying, you know, we want to give him this chance, you know, to get a bit of work experience with us. But, you know, we need to make sure that he can definitely finish his education and definitely go to university. And, you know, they didn't need to do that because by then Montel was what, 18, 19 years old. But they had this real focus on not just him, but whether this is going to be good for his future or not. And and through that, he then developed a sort of a relationship with Philippe Fowl and was able to start doing, uh, you know, yacht deliveries around the Mediterranean and things like that. So. Yeah, he, he, he was he, he did really well. He drove the whole project forwards a lot in the early days. And, you know, he's now got some great contacts. Yeah. And just to explain, he was Young Yachtsman of the Year 2017, voted for by, uh, you know, the journalists uh, of the of the Yachting Journalists Association. That's that's yeah. an inc incredible accolade, isn't it? It is. It's an amazing one. And, and he, uh, you, know, you can imagine how, how proud his family were. You can imagine how surprised the, the, the school was, as I think, from that. And I think showed a lot of other students that you really can do, do very well very quickly. But the only problem with that was that he then got a load of uh, equipment and, and sort of stuff donated to him. And when we went on the Hugo Boss boat, you know, I did the thing that a, like, the teacher should do. I, I went down there and I said, look, here's a, here's a pair of the Scaramouche wellies. You know, if you want them, it's going to be quite a wet ride on there. He said, "Oh, I won't need those," and pulled out his three hundred pound Dubarries, and then, you know, on, on on he went, and then had a had a great day out with them. So, okay. yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, you know, if if there's if there's one example of of where the you know the doors that have opened the journeys, it's it's definitely Montel. But let's let's move on to uh, Azat Ulitas, and um, we'll show a video of uh, of Azat, and then uh, you can tell us a bit more about him. Here's Azat Ulitas, and by the way, all of these, uh, um, all of these kids. I, I, I'm thinking of another word, but all of these have done the Rolex Fastnet race. Um, but we're focusing in for uh, Azat on uh, an e-boat that he restored and put in the Round the Island race. So uh, here's uh, here's Azat. Well, I kind of started in like a an un unusual way. It was more my friends telling me about it who were already involved, and Again, it was a bit confusing because I, I didn't really exactly know what I was going to do. I thought sailing was a bit more like rowing because I mean, we've never experienced anything like it. So one of my mates decided to just tell me on a Tuesday evening, I'll just come out sailing. Um, had I, I think I had chemistry last period, didn't want to go. So I ended up going to the reservoir instead. And then, yeah, from then it all just began. 
but yeah, initially it was a bit of confusion and didn't know what to expect. But I mean, I'm glad that I've taken it on now. Well, initially my parents didn't really know much about it. I mean, they just thought I went out, did a few hours on a boat and and it, they didn't think it was anything on the scale that we actually did, like where we were going to sea and everything. They just thought it was like a, a lake and we would go out drifting along for a few hours and then come back in. But then when I showed her some of the videos that uh, Mr. Holt took on the trip, uh, she was a bit worried at the beginning, but then when she saw that we were having that fun and learning, she was uh, impressed at the same time. You've really got into doing up boats. Why do you, what do you like about boat building? Well, the the best bit about it is you can compete with boats that have multi-million pound budgets on like, like our e-boat, for example, which we done up uh, for like over a long period of time. We ended up racing against, uh, with, against Fast 40s during Cows Week, Gladiator, and these boats have uh, multi-million, some of them have multi-million pound budgets and we're out here on our boat that we've done up for uh, maybe like a f like almost 1% of their their budget and we're out there competing against and then uh, even in some cases beating them so that's probably the best bit about it. Yeah and, and I'm going to take you back to the round the island race and, and, uh, and Mr Holt told me you just were not going to give up. Why Why were you so determined to finish that race? Well, I mean, we spent eight months on a boat um, and it was tough, like, sanding down all this and putting many hours into working day and night. And then there was just, we just saw no point in really giving up because even if we were to give up, we were at the backside of the island. So we still had to sail all the way around to get back in. So there was no point in really giving up. So, yeah, we just carried on. What did you learn about yourself in the fast net race? Um, the main thing I learned yeah, about myself is how uh, resilient uh, I could get after like a long period of time. So first day, second day is around, and the third and fourth day, especially uh, last year's fast net was really tough because of how uh, windy and um, there was like, we didn't really get much sleep. Uh, food was a problem. And we still managed to get up every for every shift on time with our gear on and yeah, just got on with it, and that kind of that kind of impressed me about myself. Okay, would you do it again? Oh, uh, definitely. You said that without hesitation. Why? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of the biggest races in the world, and you do compete against the best in the fast net. So, well, I mean, why not? Before sailing, it was uh, just like the same old routine: getting up, going to school, this, this, that. And then as soon as I started the sailing, I started gaining a lot of opportunities. So, and these are opportunities where I didn't think uh, would come from. So for a university, for example, uh, giving, uh, putting all my sailing, um, things that I've done in sailing, I've got like almost like, I've got unconditional offer from universities and this has helped me a lot. So, and I know it's from the sailing as well because half my statement was about sailing. So it's kind of helped me in unusual ways like that. Yeah, yeah, just wanted to say, um, uh, some people that live in like the inner city area don't really know how to get involved uh, in the sport. Uh, so just like um, a few things, and if you're worried, uh, trying to say, if you just go out there to any club, uh, there everyone's like really friendly, and they will get you uh, on the water, on the water um, without uh, any hassle. Uh, don't be scared. Just if you just get the basics right, uh, I'm sure like you'll be alright. And just like. Be a sponge. Uh, you can learn so much in a uh, short space of time. He's a bit of a character, as that, isn't he? Uh, yeah, he is a character, absolutely. Yeah, he's a, a very good fun to uh, to sail with. Uh, very different to Montel. He's. Uh, I don't think he'd be offended if I said he's a lot more arrogant than Montel. He. Uh, <laughs> he, he. He believes that the uh, that the world's uh, boundaries don't really apply to him, and when you're when you're someone who's in school, that's not necessarily the best uh, things to attributes to have. Uh, he was a, a bit of a kid who sort of stood at the gates, you know, looked a bit cynically at anyone who went by or anything like that. And uh, but he's someone that, where in sailing that for him that was a massive advantage. When he when he got involved in sailing, he was uh, nothing phased him or phases him about how much he he needs to learn. He, he knows he's got 
to get a lot of experience. He knows there's a lot of areas he needs to sort of uh, sort of, sort of to, to get to grips with, and he and he does that. And he he has a, a major focus on on uh, his his work rate. Um, he has this sort of idea that, and he's absolutely right that he is the hardest working um, you know young sailor that, that we've got. Everyone he's sailed with has been impressed by him, whether it's you know the you know, ex Great Britain sailors, you know Martin Evans or Matt Reed, uh, international coach Gonzalo. They're all all of them have been very impressed. We've been sailing with him, so he's made it. He's made a really big impression in a very short period of time. Yeah, and uh, j- just to recap, just slightly. So I think Graham Sunderland was involved in pointing them and says, "Oh, there's this there's this old e boat up there. You know, why did you know?" And 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 and, and Azat and a bunch of them did this boat up and it was an absolute wreck wasn't it yeah the the boat when we went to see it well, first of all i was very i wasn't really up for it at all because uh, we, we already had a lot of boats and for me there's just another one when we went to see it it was actually a weekend where i said to my wife let's go and have a weekend in cows and she said fine as long as there's nothing to do with boats so i assured her it wasn't and of course we went there and i tried to find a reason for going to a schooling cows have a look at this boat and the you know it was on a it's on a rib trailer so the supports for the for the rib had, had pushed through the bottom of the hull uh, all of the, the it was an absolute wreck but um it was actually kevin downer as well uh, who, of the actual mm-hmm. fleet who said you know what this could have a really good rating and okay you won't be able to beat them obviously pe- beat people over the line you know or anything like that but you can win races on 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 handicap which you know they then set about and and, and did really well if they their time had have counted in that round the island race. I think they'd have been 14th, but yeah, unfortunately incredible. it didn't. <laughs> and and I think Azat says a very interesting thing at the end of that video there, and that and and he wasn't coached into saying it. He he said at the end of that video that if there's other kids out there like him, they should get to their local sailing club. They'll be welcomed in, and mm. I I think that's a very important message because a lot of kids think that they won't belong and at the moment loads of sailing clubs are desperate to get young sailors into their clubs mm. and i think it's important that as i decided to highlight that yeah i think it's also important to highlight that how good sailing clubs can be but we've got a link with limington town sailing club which uh someone called nick hopwood uh made that connection for us and they have been absolutely amazing they've organized all sorts of fundraising and talks and things like that for us they've allowed our students to take part in dinghy races now which they do on what well, they did before the lockdown on sundays so the sailing clubs are really welcoming provided you actually make the effort to to go to them and then try and actually do the sport mm. yeah I, I i think it's very important that as highlighted that well from as we're going to next ha- have a look at sean williams who him and Azat, I, I know you told me they're they're as thick as thieves. I think was the uh, expression you used, but very different personalities. Let's uh, play the video from Sean Williams and then uh, come back to John. You're proudly wearing your uh, Scarlet Oyster shirt there. Um, yeah. You did the transatlantic with Scarlet Oyster. Fifteen days. That is rapid. What did you <laughs> learn about yourself? Sean, I learned that I could have, have, have a good time management, especially when we had to get up in the night and with all the shifts. I learned, um, you know, you could have to get uh, along with people that I could get along with people well, especially going onto another boat. So it was, uh, it was a very good experience, and um, I. I I saw areas where I can improve, and uh, Ross, Ross, uh, especially taught me a lot. Okay, yeah, he's he's he's, he's quite something, Ross, isn't he? he? He is he is the ultimate petrol head when it comes to boats. He, that's all he he wants to talk about, Ross, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> very inspiring. And um, going to the Rolex Fastnet race. What did you learn about yourself in that show? Well, um, uh, res- resilience, really, because uh, going on for even even in the arc doing the arc race, which was fifteen days, um, I learned in the fastnet, you know, how to 
to keep on going. Like when it gets tough, then you know, never to back down. Okay. Yeah, don't back down. Very good. And um Sean, how has sailing changed your life? I changed my life because because uh, you get um lots of opportunities, especially uh me going out to Grenada and uh doing anti Antigua as well. Um so yeah, you get to meet a lot of people as well. So yeah, it really changed my life in the, in that way. Okay. And what's what are your study plans after the Greg City Academy? Uh, I'm planning to go off to uni to study product design in Bournemouth. And do a bit of sailing down there, maybe? Yeah, I, I, I want to do sailing down there as well. Sean Williams there. And can I just say a quick thank you to Ross Appleby, Scarlet Oyster, for the, for the video. Um, also, Grenada Sailing Week and uh, the Liquid team. And also Antigua Sailing Week with their Y2K programme. And I know the Greg City Academy have, have been to Antigua Sailing Week as well. You, you nearly didn't get him back for the Caribbean, did you? <coughs> no, I mean, um, so no, Sean, Sean is a, a unique individual. He's, a, he's unintentionally hilarious is how I'd describe him. But he's a, he's a, he's a brilliant individual, I think, uh, for, for young people who think of getting into sailing for several reasons. He... When he was sort of starting sailing, the, a lot of the focus was on the students who did that first fast net in 2017. And he was very much in the shadow of the likes of Montel. And at school, it, it was fairly, from what I remember, he was fairly quiet and withdrawn. And, and I think maybe he was a bit misunderstood at school a little bit. And uh, it, whereas what actually then happened was he got into the sixth form, he started continuing with the sailing and he just chipped away and chipped away and then became the logical person to take over for Montel as the primary helmsman. And then we had one race, which was this, uh, this Asto race from, uh, from uh, Ramsgate to Gosport. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those races where if you made it past the first headland, you were in pretty good shape before the tide turned. And then uh, he helmed all the way to the first one for three hours, really good focus. Uh, the skippers we had at the time made real mention of how focused he was and everything. And then we made it past the next headland and nobody else did. And then from then onwards, he really established himself as, as, that, as that really good, committed um, a helmsman who had actually, by this stage, you know, a lot of experience, uh, you know, as, as much as some of the older ones did. And I think for, for me, the best thing about Sean is, is how, how keen and how willing he is to undertake opportunities. Because you can imagine uh, when, when Ross gave him the opportunity to go across the Atlantic, um, he... You know, I had a parental meeting with him and his mum, and you can imagine sitting there trying to explain to a parent of a student who comes from a, a an inner London school near Tottenham to explain to them what it's going to be like for him sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. And um, she kept on saying to me, he said, look, I, I trust you and I trust the project. You know, I'm sure you'll keep him safe. And I was thinking, OK, but I won't be there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's almost it's still quite quite mind blowing that that he's he sailed across the Atlantic and then and then won it and then you're absolutely right we nearly didn't get him back because he was supposed to come back in December so I'd convinced his mum it was a good idea because he'd be back for Christmas so I said to him when he finished I said just let me know when you need your flight back and he goes oh I might I might do the delivery of Scarlet Oyster to Antigua I said okay then fine we'll get your flight from there and then he said well I've just talked my way onto a boat called uh, Liquid Team Liquid and then. He did that and they said, oh, I want to do the round, the, the round Antigua race, which he did. And then they won that. And then he said, well, I was like, OK, you need to fly back now. It's now January. And then he said, oh, I'm actually a bit of advice to go and do Grenada week. And then I was like, well, OK, but at some point you do actually have to come home. You know, you need, do need to come back. And uh, I think he came back in mid-February, I think it was. But, I mean, he also is, again, is, is very clear about, about being long term within the project, which for me, within sailing. So he's chosen to go next year to Bournemouth University for, for two reasons. I mean, one is that I think probably a minor reason is that he, it does the course he wants to do. And then it's near to Scarlet Oyster where that's based. And then it's also near to Ocean Yacht Systems where he's hoping to get you know, some work experience and things like that. So I just think Sean has, has you know, he's made opportunities for himself and, and taken them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, he was giggling during that interview just thinking about transatlantic for a kid that you know t 
to for anybody to cross an ocean is an amazing experience so yeah. you know what could i say uh, that, that's yeah. quite quite unbelievable um so moving on from sean and there is a a, a direct link with our next uh, greg city academy pupil and that's kai hockley and kai was 13 when he did the 2019 rolex fast it race and he wasn't like sitting at the back making the sandwiches was he john just actually just tell us a little bit about kai how it is 13 years of age doing the fast that's incredible yeah kai is uh, he's a very astute 13 year old he, he he's seen what he saw what all the others did the montels the camillos the azats the shawns and then he sort of worked out for himself quite rightly what the best route forwards was for him and he's he was very very dinghy based he did a huge amount of sailing on on toppers and lasers and now is his chosen one the 420 but um w- with the fast net i mean we were never we weren't going to originally take him we just felt he was too young and then there was one weekend where some of his other teammates had an event in in Kashkai, and he had a choice of either going to Kashkai or doing the race to la Havre. and he chose to do the race to la Havre. and i thought I thought that's a bit strange. And then, uh, anyway, he did, and then did really well in that. Um, it was very windy. It's 25 knots all the way there, or more than that, I think, a lot of the way there. And then after that, we did the Myth of Malham. And having done the Myth of Malham, he'd done more than the qualifying miles that were needed. So he didn't have to do the Cal St. Marlow race, but he was absolutely clear that he was going to do the Cal St. Marlow race because um, after he'd done that, plus the deliveries back, he'd, he'd have then done more than 600 miles. And therefore, there's no way that we could tell him he couldn't go. So he really okay. does put in the hard draft. So yeah. he wasn't going to get pushed out by the older ones. And he didn't. And he did the fastener. And as you say, he's not hes not just sort of someone who's who's a bit of a passenger. You know, he's, he's someone who, who is very determined. And our, our skipper on the fastener, David Pritchard, you know, he was, he's made a lot of comments about how impressed he was with his ability to, uh, you know, stay focused and that kind of thing. OK. Yeah, I mean, I mean... We're focusing this video on Kai Hockley in the 420, but um, you know I think it's worth highlighting that Kai was a was one of your principal helmsmen in the 2019 Rolex Fastnet race. Let's uh, let's see a bit of Kai Hockley uh, zooming around in a 420, and then we'll come back to John. When you go to most schools, saying it's non-existent. It's normally basketball or football. So when Sir taught us the assembly about sailing, it was a good opportunity to try something new. And what did your mum and dad, your brother, your sister, your friends, what did they think when you said, I'm going to try this sailing? Yeah, they were quite shocked. Right? Sailing in the inner school, inner city school, that's not, it's not very common. So they were wondering how I how was I going to do it. Okay. And you were the youngest competitor in the 2019 Fastnet race. Tell me, what did you learn about yourself in that race? Uh, I learned I learned to keep my focus for a long period of time because normally I'll be sailing for two or one hour on a dinghy, but sailing for like four days straight. It made me focus quite a lot. Kai, why do you like 420 sailing so much? Uh, I enjoy sailing on 420 because moving about, you have to, it's quite an active boat, so you always have to be doing something. And yeah, it's quite exciting when you're like, surfing down waves. But it's kind of opened up more opportunities. Because like, in school, they get like people, with, um, lawyers, and uh, people that work in banks to show you like different careers but now I started sailing there's so many different careers I can pick like it's not just sailing it could be boat maintenance there could be uh, sea rescue it could be any different things anybody starting off with sailing um, it might not be uh, as fun at the beginning that like you're in the winter you're sailing in the cold but if you keep that determination you'll slowly progress and then or become an amazing sport, and you won't be able to uh, get off the ball. I can't believe he's only 14, uh, speaking like that. And none of that was rehearsed. That was 
straight off the tee that was. Yeah, and he's he's a he's a very driven driven young man, and uh, he's he's got he's getting he's getting really good coaching. He's coached by Matt Reed. He's very he's mu- very much looking forward to. He's made a connection with Gonzalo Ribeiro. You know, he, he's he's got a, a good future ahead of him. I think in the sport. I mean, just look at him. He's got the physique. You know, he's certainly got the attitude. He's now getting some, you know, world class training in the yeah. in the four in the four twenty. I don't want to put a a target on his back or something, but he he could go places, couldn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think he I think he could. I think everything we've that's been said so far about him, everything we've seen from the coaches has been very positive. So he wants to go places, and I think whereas Montel maybe was a trailblazer in terms of sailing in the first place, um, I think. Kai certainly could go quite a long way. Perhaps he could be a trailblazer into 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 bigger, you know, may, maybe national, you know, dinghy racing scene and things like that. Yeah, and and that little clip at the end where we saw all the kids going into the water, having a bit of a laugh. Just just tell us a little bit about that trip down to Portugal, John. Um, well, Portugal has been has been a great thing for us. So. Uh, uh, Pedro Andrade has started a, a dragon uh, project down there with 8D sailing, and it's just a it's just a brilliant, brilliant uh, sailing place to go to. You can imagine we go out there, our older students race on the dragon, and then our younger ones, a lot of them, are ra- are sailing on 420s and optimists for the youngsters as well. And they get you can imagine how brilliant it is for them. They get to you know mix and rub shoulders with with people who are in the national teams. They see the Great Britain sailing team out there, and and they go out there with a real purpose. You know, it's because of the fact they've they've trained so hard in the UK and they, and they've raised the money to do it that they're able to go out and do that. And they have to have a combination of obviously the right level of dedication, the right skill, all those sorts of things, and they're they're rewarded with that. And I mean, you see from that at the end, they're just they're also they're just good fun to go sailing with. You know, they are up for a laugh. Uh, they're they're you know they're 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 real sponges as well. I think is that. One of the biggest attributes they've got is that they will take advice from anyone who's who's prepared to give them that advice. So we just make sure that we get the right people there to give them that. <laughs> and it is important that, isn't it? If it's fun, they're much more likely to, to take part and enjoy yeah. it and, and fall in love with it, like so many of them have. I mean, I, I, did I hear something like, how, how many kids do you reckon have gone through the Scaramouche project, John? I mean, there's there's hundreds. I mean, it's a, if you right from the beginning, you know, there'll be there'll be way over 500. And and, and in a typical year, we've got probably. I mean, I'd, I'd say in terms of the ones who take it like really seriously, there's probably about 30 who are absolutely, you know, borderline obsessives. There's probably 20 who are obsessed. Um, and then after that, there's others who'll just do it. That they'll go sailing as a, as an activity in the school. They might go several times a year. But the ones, these ones who are going off to Portugal, you know, they're sailing five days a week at the local reservoir, then going to Cowes every single weekend or Southampton every single weekend or Limington. So it's just, it's become a massive part of their lifestyle. And I suppose one of the reasons why they do it, I think one of the reasons is, is that the whole project provides progression, whether it's through, whether it's through dinghy sailing and offshore or a combination of the two, definitely getting the right, the right knowledge in there. I think there's this, there's this massive uh, wealth of untapped knowledge. I've said before, the ones we use, Matt Reed and Martin Evans, you know, they've, they've been through the whole Great Britain system. So all, all it, when you get advice and guidance from them, then suddenly this whole sailing sort of um, project becomes really serious for the for the boys. And, you know, but they mentioned David Bedford, they've been coached by before, all these sorts of things. They're, they're really like, they're getting top, top tuition and they know therefore they're doing this at a good level. Yeah, yeah. And, um, Coming from North London, as all these kids do, you know, f- football's massive up there. You got, you know, you got Tottenham Hotspurs. You've got, um, I bet if I don't mention Arsenal, my son will uh, disown me. Uh, and you know, and obviously that's a big sport at your school because the, the Great City Academy they you, they play a lot of sports to a very high standard. How is sailing perceived as a sport throughout the school? Um, it's perceived as being a very tough sport. Um, it's they're quite right in that if you do, sa- I mean, anyone in our school can do sailing because there's always because we do every single aspect of sailing because we do inshore and offshore, we do racing, we do expeditions. There's always an element that it's that everyone can do. 
Um, the key thing is for us, though, I think it's that if they do it, they have to do it seriously because it has to be, as I said before, like measurably life changing. There's got to be something that happens which benefits them because they've done the sport. And um, and so I think it's perceived as one which is which is very difficult. Um, and we, we, no, it's perceived as one where you have to have a lot of uh, a lot of commitment. But then it's also perceived as one which is which is tough because, as you can imagine, our our young sailors, our boys, the ones you've heard tonight, yeah, you know, they're like anyone who's into sailing. They get back and they they add a little bit of exaggeration here or there to how high the high the winds were, to how big the waves were. They come back with their war stories as these heroes who've just sailed back from France. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure that necessarily makes everyone think, oh great, let's go and do that next weekend. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, that's a very good point. We always, it always gets a bit bigger, the wave, and as you say. Um, and, and tell me, John, you know, if, if there's a teacher watching this whose school doesn't have sailing as a sport, what advice would you give a, a teacher who's thinking about doing exactly what you've done? Um, the first thing I'd advise them to do is feel free to contact us because we've had a we've had a lot of success and we've got a lot of things right, but we've also got a lot of things wrong as well. If we if we were doing it again, there's certain things we would definitely change. Uh, there's uh, and I think the, the problem if someone's thinking of going sailing and they go and ask one centre, they're going to specialise in one aspect of sailing, and because we do all of them, you know, we could get a feel for what do they want to get out of it. Do, do they want to? Do it where it's a, an elite sport where they want to do dinghy racing. Do they want to do um, offshore racing? Do they want to do expeditions? So like a Duke of Edinburgh expedition and use sailing for that. Do they want to use it with with big numbers and or small numbers? You know what what do they want what do they want to do? So the first thing I'd do is this maybe speak to us because we've done it before about what what aspect of sailing might they go for. I think then after that then I think making sure that they definitely get the right advice from the start. Uh, that it's very important that they they do get uh, coaches who who are have got good standards and are teaching them the kids good stuff, um, and then I suppose also you know maybe even having taken all the advice is to go what they they feel is right for them because you know we, we've had a lot of people who've told us that Scaramouche was the wrong boat for us to get, and in reality it's probably been our biggest asset because it's hard because it's old fashioned because it's difficult to sail. When our boys do get opportunities and the girls get their opportunities on other boats, you know, they, they, they find other boats relatively straightforward to sail compared to Scaramouche. So um, I think sometimes, you know, maybe go with what they think is right as well. Yeah, th- thank you, John. And John, well, that's all we've time for this week. Uh, John, a last few words from you. Um, well, I mean, my main thing is to just say thank you to the whole sailing world because there's the sailing organisations, lots of people who've enabled this to, to happen. Um, you know, uh, in particular, there's certain people who've, who've really helped it along the way. You know, the other teacher, Paul Letford, uh, Nick Hopwood, David Pritchard, there's other people who are, uh, who've really helped it um, all along. Uh, having an understanding wife in my position is also very important as well. Um, and then also it's a thank you to the crew as well. The, you can't do this sort of thing unless you have the right individuals involved with the crew. They have to have that degree, an initial bit of resilience and daring and that kind of thing. Um, and they've been really good. I mean, last year, last September, uh, my dad, who started all of this for me, um, originally he died and, they, um, and it, was a big, it was a big thing to, to deal with. But every time the, the crew have a success, it's like a bit of a, a success for him, which is which is great. And then I think the last thing is worth pointing out, obviously on the news, I know there's been talk of it in the sailing world, we can't ignore this, this sort of question everyone's asking about inclusion and diversity and that kind of thing. And, uh, and I think sometimes people find it awkward to, to discuss this, these aspects of, of not just society, but also the sport as well. And I think my sort of message there is, is let's not be awkward about it. There's, a, there's an example here of where students are excelling in the sport from every different ethnicity you could possibly possibly imagine um, and they are being ta- having lots of people from the sailing world taking them under their wing being generous with their time being generous with equipment you know financially in some cases you know David Franks has helped us a whole whole lot through this project we've done you know we've got Darren Doherty from the City of London uh, from Jewel uh, Under Isis who's twice now helped us when we were in really dark times financially um, so I think you know we've got a lot that we can maybe offer the sport beyond actually sailing itself. And uh, we're, you know, hope, hoping to be able to put stuff back in to the sport. 
Well, I'll tell you what, John. I think you have blasted this concept of the Blue Blazer Brigade is all sailing is about. I think you have absolutely blown a hole through that concept with the Greg City Academy. And it's been utterly inspiring taking a look behind the scenes of the Scaramouche project. Uh, and I'm sure everyone watching wishes you all fair wins for the future. Um, John, next week on the Rourke Time Over Distance series, same time, same place, we are really changing it up. Uh, we will be with one of the world's leading boat builders. We're talking about the builder of Asser Abloy, Ran, Hugo Boss, and Ineos Team UK's AC75 Britannia. Jason Carrington will be on the show next week, next Friday. We will play you out with a magical moment for the Scaramouche team as they cross the finish line in the 2019 Rolex Fastnet race. Thank you, everybody, for watching. <laughs>